next presentation will be an academics update by uh, Mr. David Hurst, our interim assistant superintendent. Thank you. So again, it's that time of year where we present the academic update. Um, and I'd like to recognize and thank the principals and supervisors for being here tonight. Um, not only are they here to support their presentation and help answer any questions that you may have, um, but they also provided a great support to me in putting the presentation together. Um, and as you can imagine, it was, it's a um, pretty large task, and I certainly couldn't have done this um, without their help and support, so I thank them for that. So if, just to recap sort of our overall results, um, once again, BCSD has made AYP on all of its exams and among all subgroups, and therefore we've been designated as a district in good standing. And because we've achieved these types of results for numerous years now, um, we've actually, six of our schools have been identified um, by state ed as a reward school. Um, and just to give you sort of the magnitude of that, there's only 365 schools in the entire state that are recognized for, with this honor. And to have six of our schools recognized um, is quite an achievement. Um, all five of our elementary buildings in our middle school um, were recognized as high performing, and Hamagrel actually was high performing and high progress which they have similar um, criteria, but the high progress has to do a little bit more with um, growing from prior results. The three main criteria for these categories are um, the, the school has to maintain AYP for two consecutive years. They have to successfully close gaps in their subgroups. So for instance, um, our students with disabilities subgroup typically performs at a lower level than all students. So there's a gap between those two. And if you were to close that gap from year A to year B, um, that is one of the criteria. And then the third criteria is actually how your proficiency rate compares with schools with the rest of the state. You have to be in the um, top 20% of the state to qualify. Um, so all six of our schools there um, met those criteria. So just to sort of give you an update on where we are in terms of the testing and curriculum, um, we're moving right along. This is really our fourth um, year um, dealing with the Common Core State Standards. As you recall, we actually started with our kindergarten first and second graders or a year prior to the state mandate. Um, but in 2012-13, that was the big rollout statewide. And that spring was the first exposure to the assessments aligned to the Common Core Standards. And Bethlehem, just like all of the schools <coughs> in the state, saw a dramatic decrease in proficiency rates. Um, we dropped 22% in ELA and 32% in math, um, which was pretty consistent with the rest of the state. The following year, they implemented um, the Algebra One Common Core Regents and the curriculum for the Common Core ELA. But because that's a sort of a three-year program, we won't see the impact of that until this year, which is the first year our students will actually be taking the exam. Last year, we saw the implement implementation of geometry, and this year, we will see the implementation of Algebra 2 and the administration of the um, English exam, and that will basically complete the three year phase in of the Common Core um, program at the high school level. So, if we take a look at um, our proficiency rates, and it's um, the state breaks things up into levels, levels one through four, where three and four are what they would consider proficient. Um, you can see that we're, you know, in the ELA, we're, you know, roughly 55-ish percent on average with our proficiency rates. Math a little bit higher, um, closer to 60 percent with a seemingly dramatic dip in eighth grade. But remember, if you look at the, the size of that cohort, only 162 students actually took that exam. And that's because our accelerated students, we do not double test. So there's a large number of students that actually do not take that exam. Um, that's indicated in the... Um, line below. If we were, though, to adjust, um, just to be fair, all of our students that take the algebra regions or the um, geometry regions in middle school, they all achieve proficiency. In fact, most of them achieve mastery level. If we were to assume that they would do the same thing on the state testing level, um, we would see that those numbers do jump in line with, um, you know, the rest of the three through eight testing for math. The seventh grade number would jump to 63 percent, and the eighth grade number would jump to 57 percent if we were to include those groups um, back into the testing program. Can I ask? Do you want me to wait, or can I ask? Go ahead. Uh, with, the, with the math common core for eighth grade students, it explains 
the large number of students taking, obviously, advanced math and taking the Common Core exam, so they're not in that number. What was the difference between 2014 in 2015 and they the also they also did not take it in 2014 no no I just meant for the the common core exam does it is that later on in the present the regents exams are later yes okay this is strictly three through eight okay. we will get to the regents exams um, and during the high school portion okay. so taking a look at participation on um, there was a lot of talk last year about opt-outs um, it certainly got a lot of talk in the press and you can see that um, you know we saw a substantial number of our students opting out and this obviously has an impact on our numbers um, on average about 20 percent of our students opt out of the ELA program um, and within those opt-outs they weren't really from any one particular category it actually broke out perfectly half of our opt-outs had scored proficient the prior year and the other half scored not proficient so it's not like it would have skewed our numbers um, in terms of overall proficiency but it did just obviously dropped the number of students taking the exam. Um, we saw a much more dramatic impact on the math exams. I think given that they were given a week later, uh, momentum started to build for the opt-out movement and those numbers did increase, um, especially at the five through eight level. Um, as just discussed, you can see that our seventh and eighth grade, not only did we have the opt-out number to deal with, but we also have the regents exam number. So when we take a look at the number of, or the percent of students that actually took that eighth grade exam, only 41% of our eligible students took it. So to, to try to read too much into the proficiency rate at that, with such a large number of students not taking the exam, I think is very, very difficult to do. Um, but I think by adding the Regents exams into it does give a much clearer picture. Cool. Yes, Lynn. Will we be informing parents on, uh, I know we, we have a new education commissioner and, and she's been listening to every, all groups around the state, including parents and teachers and, um, you know, you can't change things overnight. I mean, the testing company has been eliminated, but they still have to use tests this year. But, you know, they're um, looking at shortening the tests, the three through eight English, ELA and the math. They said that they can do that. So they'll be, you know, taking items out. Do you think that'll help help with um, maybe not as many students opting out? Um, I mean, I hate to speculate on that, but the, in, in talking with parents and other school districts, um, the, the, there is, you know, most people feel the opt-out number is actually going to increase this year, not decrease. Um, they feel that it, their, their message was not made clear enough last year. So those that did opt out last year, um, many that I've spoken with said they're going to do so again and they're going to encourage more to do so because they feel that their, their message was loud but wasn't loud enough. So although the tests themselves may shorten up this year, um, I, it's, I think it's really gonna come down to the, the lobbying effort on the part of um, the folks that support the opt out movement, how far they're willing to push that agenda. We've. Uh already received opt-out requests, right. which we did not receive this early last year. And I think, unfortunately, if those assessments are still tied to teacher evaluation, that movement is still going to continue. Can, can we get the breakout of the numbers for the eighth grade Algebra one and Geometry Common Core with it not be included in the results for Math 8? I know you combined them with the scores for just the general Math 8 exam, but I'm not sure. So you want to know how the 7th and 8th grade is performed? The average, I guess the average. When we get to the high school, I can talk to that. You have the 8th grade included in I know that? it, so, but so when okay. we get there, I can break it down a little bit further. Um, so how do we compare it to the rest of the state? We're, you know, on average, we're 25 to 30% higher than um, state performance on all of the grade levels for ELA. And you know, what does that really mean? Because you say, well, you know, it's a large state. We have over 700 schools taking it. Yes, we're, we're much higher than the state average, but what, what the, where does that really put us? Um, and in terms of ELA, there's really two measures you can use to sort of compare schools. One is the scale score, um, which is sort of, if, if you think in terms of like SATs are scored on a scale from zero to 800, most of us are sort of familiar with that. The state test scores typically range from 100 to 400-ish. They change the numbers every year, which makes it very, very difficult to compare from year to year. But in one given year, you can certainly compare. 
Um, so if we were to compare our mean scale score or even our proficiency level, which are the numbers of threes and fours, on average, we're about the 91st percentile statewide. So there's only about 9% of the schools in, out of those entire 700 that are outperforming us in ELA, on, regardless of whether you look at mean scale score or percent proficient. In math, comparing, again, first I'll do it with the region students not included. Um, you can see we're still outperforming um, by about 25 to 30% on average. If we do include, so this first graphic does not include the algebra exams. If we do include the algebra exams, then you can see that it does fall in line with um, you know, the other numbers. Obviously the state number for eighth grade is also on the low end because many other schools also do not have their students double test, but there are quite a few schools that do. Um, and the main two reasons I've heard on that, one reason schools, they don't really consider it double testing because these tests occur in May. The Regents exams are in June, so they figure there's enough time in between that you're not really putting a, a huge burden on the students. And the other rationale is they don't want to see low numbers on that um, report. So in terms of percentile, um, the average, we're in about the 88th percentile for math. Um, again, if you sort of don't include that eighth grade because that's a very, very difficult grade level to compare. So you can see that our performance in math comparatively to the rest of the state is slightly lower than that for ELA. But when you, if you go back and look at our proficiency rates, our proficiency rates for math are actually higher than our proficiency rates for ELA. So that sort of signals that the ELA, ELA tests in general are more difficult exams comparatively than the math exams because we're, we're, we're scoring at a higher level proficiency-wise on the math exams, but our ranking in the state is not as high as on the ELA exams, if that makes sense. So and that is sort of illustrated in this graphic. We actually saw quite a decrease in our ELA scores from 2014 to 2015. And again, I caution you on this because it's really difficult to compare from year to year because the state adjusts the cut points every single year. Right, the last four years they've given these tests, they've moved the cut line every single year. So what was proficient last year isn't necessarily proficient this year. So to try to compare those numbers when you're moving the line, it's, it's not really all that meaningful. That's why I think the comparison within the state, where do we rank, is much more useful than just seeing what happens from year to year when there's a constant moving line in terms of cut scores. As you can see the math, we actually went up in every single one. But again, statewide, our performance was better on the ELA ranking-wise than it was on the math. What's the range sort of on the cut, the movement in the cut scores? About how, do you have a sense of how much that Well, it's in? tricky because, so let me explain to you how the scores are first arrived. So say there's 55 raw points on a test, like all the multiple choice are worth one point each, some of the free response are two, some are three, some are four. There's a total of 55 points. They then take those scores and they sort of assign them a number between 100 and 450, say. But it could turn out that, say, a score of 30 gets assigned to 300. A score of 31 gets assigned a score of 320. There's a 20-point gap there. Mm -hmm. So you, when you look at, um, you know, like an, uh, an average number, you say, well, if we have a long way to go to get from 300 to 320. But there's no, you can't get any of those numbers in between. You can only get a 31 or a 32, which then translates to this huge gap. So the cut score one year might be 300, and the next year it might be 320. So it appears to be, say, a 20-point difference. It's really not. It's one raw point difference. So the difference in getting one multiple choice right or wrong from year to year could be the difference in you being a level two or a level three. And again, only the on-grade level students were included there. So if we were to take a look at um, sort of the, our largest um, subgroup, which would be that students with disabilities, um, you can see obviously the proficiency levels are quite lower than they are for um, our general students. But again, the reason we're a reward school is because the gap between these numbers and the overall numbers, we're continuing to close. Um, and as, at first glance, these numbers may seem low, but in comparing these to schools like um, Pittsfield, Brighton, um, Byron Hills, Williamsville North, schools that are typically um, Scarsdale, 
typically referred to as the top schools um, with us in the state, our numbers are as equal, if not better, than some of those numbers. I have a question. Yes. Dave. When we do the students with disabilities, are the students that are out of district placement? They're included in they're these included numbers. included in this? Yes. Thank you. Which we don't have an over, you know, we don't have a huge number of students that are out of district place, so it wouldn't skew these numbers one way or the other um, too, too much. So here's just a quick graphic showing how our students compare with the state. It's really just a summary of the data that was provided on the previous slides uh, to show sort of where we were in 14-15, where the state was 14-15. Um, obviously, there's a sizable gap between us and the state. Um, you can see again in ELA our proficiency rate went down, our math rate went up, and the same exact phenomena happened with students with disabilities. It was very consistent. Um, so the, the students with disabilities performed using the same characteristics as the students um, in the general population. And, and these scores were achieved even with accommodation? Yes, and okay. by accommodations we have, there, you know, there's numerous accommodations mm -hmm. students receive. Um, some receive extended time, some receive separate location, some have the test read to them, some are able to use a scribe, um, you know, some are have, have directions clarified for them. There, there, there's a, it's actually a five-page document that mm -hmm. the state provides that are, you know, allowable accommodations for testing settings. Um, and then it even breaks it down into specific accommodations that are or not allowed for the ELA versus the math because of what's being tested. So for instance, if a student's allowed in general a calculator on the state assessment, they would not be because it's specifically testing computation, mm -hmm. things of that nature. And those are reviewed each year? I can't hear what you're saying. Those are reviewed each year. Okay. For every student. For, right. Okay, so now um, outside the 3 through 8 math realm, which tends to kind of get the bulk of the um, attention, um, there is a science test, grades four and eight. If you recall, years ago, there would also be a social studies test, grades five and eight, but the state, because of budgetary reasons, um, cut that exam. But our proficiency level on the science exam continues to be very high. It's 94% um, for both the fourth and eighth grade levels, and we're consistently in the 94 to 96% range um, on those exams. So for regents, I've sort of broken it down into um, disciplines, if you will. The first slide represents sort of our humanities courses, um, English and our two history exams. Um, you can see that we have very, very high passing rates and mastery rates on all three of those exams. Um, for our science exams, um, as you can see, for the first two, our passing and mastery rates are both very, very high. Um, for our chemistry and physics exams, they do drop a little, and people typically tend to question this, but I do caution you, there's sort of two things at play here. Um, one, those are, you know, those are two far much more difficult in terms of content. But second, the way the state scales things, the scales on the chemistry and physics exams are much more aggressive than the scales on the earth science and the living environment exam. So just to point out an example, the state, similar to the way they do the three through eight testing, they assign grades between zero and 100, but they're not really percentages. So in other words, on the chemistry exam, in order to get an 85 on their scale, you actually have to answer 88% of the points correctly. So to get on the high end scale for chemistry and physics um, is actually sort of much more challenging than it is on the earth science and living environment exams because of the way the scales are set. The same thing happens with the math exams. Um, the new common core exams, the way they're doing the cut scores, um, they've really changed how to achieve mastery. So for example, on the algebra exam, you actually have to get 87% of the points to score an 85, um, which is, so you'll see there's a um, decrease in our algebra um, mastery numbers. I will caution you that the integrated algebra numbers look very, very low traditionally. Our integrated algebra results were 95% like passing, you know, 60% mastery. Um, these numbers only represent, only 37 students took that exam. It was our last cohort of students that were eligible to take that exam. There were students in our two-year stretch program. So um, obviously these are students that really struggle with math. 
So it's, it's expected if you're only looking at that group of students, the results are not going to compare very well with when our entire population took that exam. We did have 370 students take the Regents in Algebra 1 um, with 86% passing and 16% mastery, which the mastery number um, and the passing number, are, again, much lower than we're used to seeing with the old integrated algebra. But in comparing with the rest of the Suburban Council, we're actually in the top three schools um, with those results. It's a much, much more challenging exam now. We have seen, two, this is the second year now of that test. On average, the scores are 10 points lower than they were when we gave the integrated algebra exam. So back, um, Christine, to your point, uh, traditionally the average um, at the middle school on the integrated algebra exam was about a 90% for accelerated students. And for the um, Common Core Algebra 1 exam, it's about 80%. I guess my biggest concern when I look at these numbers is I get concerned when the kids are applying to college outside of New York State and we're hitting them twice. We're hitting them with a region score on their transcript and we're hitting them with 20% of their grade, including the tests that we're not quite proficient in getting above an 85. The 16% is extremely low. For our district, we're used to higher numbers with the region's exam. And I guess I just want to get a little rationale behind why is that still our practice? Because I think it's going to hurt the current group of 10th, 11th, and 12th graders until we get this system down and we really understand Common Core a little more. Okay, two things. First, we're not the only school struggling with that. No, um, I know. I know. So, so it's been um, a very hot topic in our, especially our suburban council um, supervisors meetings. And actually today we had a supervisors meeting here and this was one of the items on our agenda was how are we going to um, address the impact that these exams are now having on students' transcripts. Um, so we, we met about it in supervisors' meeting today. Um, people are going to collect data from other schools to see what they're doing. We're going to talk with our departments, and we're going to revisit it again next month at our supervisors' meeting. Okay. And we hope to have a recommendation very soon as to how we're going to proceed going forward with using okay. regents' exams in students' final exam averages. Because I'm glad to hear that you're looking at it, because now we have also the English exam rolling out for the 11th graders this year, and right. it's and it's very concerning. Those, we and have I, social studies coming, and social yes. studies coming, and science coming in the next few years, also. In New York State, I know they have a lot of different things, but they don't recommend including it. And I know all the suburban council districts do. It's a bone of contention between the two organizations. But I'm glad that you're. Right. having the discussion. So hopefully um, not next month, but the following month after we've had a chance to revisit it in supervisors meeting, I can report back to where that we are with that. That would be great. That. Thank is you. It, is the regents a separate score though on, or a separate item on a transcript? Yes. So you have to, it, 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 the law requires you to report the score on the transcript. You're not required to include it as part of the average. Okay. So the reason geometry is up there twice is um, similar to last year's algebra. Students were allowed to take both the new Common Core geometry exam and the old geometry exam. Um, and again, I, it's hard to put too much stock in the Common Core numbers because students knew they had this safety net to fall back on. They had 10 years worth of history to study for the old exam. They had zero years of history to study for the new exam. So I would imagine most students put most of their efforts into studying for an exam they could um, accurately target. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, though, our results um, average wise, we did not see a 10 point drop like we did with the algebra. It was only about a five point drop. And knowing that the exam was given a month earlier almost, um, because they give it the first week of June, um, it gave teachers you know, almost three full weeks less time to prepare um, for the course. We think going forward, that exam is going to actually provide much less of a challenge in terms of meeting our old benchmarks for averages than the algebra one does. Okay, so for AP results, um, we continue to excel in offering um, AP courses. You know, we're right about the 90% mark in terms of students scoring three or higher, which the College Board deems proficient, um, which many colleges will then grant um, placement and credit for those courses. Um, you know, it, it's a good 25, again, points above the state average and you know worldwide it's almost 40 or 30 percent above that so we actually had 462 students take AP exams um, and we wrote 872 exams so obviously many students are doubling up on exams and this number 
has actually, this number has grown 30% in the last five years. So since 2010, we've had 30% more exams written in AP um, than, you know, going forward. And you would think that that might cause our numbers to dip a little bit because we, we do have an open enrollment policy here where students, if they want to take an AP course, they can, whereas some other schools are very, very stringent upon if you don't meet certain prerequisite requirements, you absolutely cannot take the course. Um, we have an open enrollment here, and even with that, we continue to maintain very, very high standards. You can see that our average on most of the exams, you know, hovers between 3.8 and 4. And statewide and worldwide, those averages usually hover between 2.8 and 3. So we're a solid point ahead of both state and global um, averages on these exams. Remember that a 3.0 is essentially proficient. Um, so, you know, listed there are the arts, the English, and the history and social science exams. Next, we have our math, science, and world language exams. Um, and I think it's sort of, you can see there that there appears to be sort of a dip in physics one, physics two. Um, that's a brand new exam last year. It used to be a single exam. It's now broken into two exams. And it was far, far different than the way the course had been structured before. Um, and we're well aware that these results are not up to our standards and we're working on um, you know, closing that gap and getting things back to where they traditionally were. And the final piece are the diploma types and graduation rate. We had 369 graduates walk across the stage last June, um, which our best guess in terms of a graduation rate is 95%. These numbers are sort of tricky to figure out. We don't have a solid number from the state itself yet. This is sort of our best guess uh, because the state has both four-year and five-year graduation rates, and there's a lot that goes into figuring out cohorts, who really belongs in the graduation cohort. So this is our sort of most conservative estimate, 95%. Um, but you, know, you can see that about a third of our students receive advanced regents diplomas, about another third receive advanced regents with honors, which means basically that they achieve mastery on all of the required regents exams. Um, so 85 or better on six regents exams. And then about a third achieve just a, a regents diploma, which is just the, the core six exams without going above and beyond those. So some things we're looking to do this year, some of these are continuations, some of these are um, sort of new initiatives. Um, obviously we're gonna continue to support the implementation of the Common Core Learning Standards for both ELA and math. Um, we're going to conduct data analysis of the state data. And again, this is, this is becoming increasingly frustrating because the amount of data they give us um, is not as useful as we'd like it to be. It's very difficult to compare from year one to year two because of the moving cut scores. They only release half the test, um, but we're trying to use that data as best we can certainly provide support to students that are struggling. Um, we're looking to continue to refine our local assessments so that they're rigorous, rigorous enough that the students are able to meet these standards. Um, support collaborative planning and goal setting. Continue to explore ways technology can be used. Um, expand the computer science program. I think one of the things I'd like to highlight is, you know, this year we're running a computer science program um, through Siena College for the first time. We had 48 students sign up for that class. We only had room for 24 um, because it's a grant-funded program, but we're hoping next year to be able to um, expand the number of sections in that course and be able to offer it to um, all 48 students if that many choose to enroll again. And then to continue to explore the IB program, I know Mr. Landry has a presentation coming up at a future board meeting, and he'll be able to speak um, more to that. So I know we had questions along the way, but if you have any Final questions. I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. I do have a question, and, and Ms. Um, Mrs. Johnson might be able to help. Even, so I'm struggling with the even with accommodation students, and I'm sure it's a very complex issue and area. So even with accommodation, we have 75% of students with disabilities scoring at level one for math, and 50% of them scoring level one, 50% at level one on ELA. So can you just give a, maybe a more of a sense of what we else we could do for those students, or is that kind of the expectation? I mean, I'm, so like I said, it's one thing if students were not receiving accommodations. Mm -hmm. So just if you could fill us in a bit more about um, why those scores fall at that level. 
again, realizing it's a very complex situation. So um, for our students, I mean, they are, you know, it, it's, it's a huge picture because mm -hmm. we're talking about students with a variety of disabilities. Mm -hmm. We have students with um, significant learning disabilities. We have students with significant behavioral issues. Um, the accommodations, is, as Dave mentioned, is five pages long because, you know, if you're a student with significant <coughs> learning issues, you might need help with somebody assisting with the test being read to you. And then there's extra time that goes into it because they have to process all of um, the information that's, that's coming in their direction. Um, we don't expect that those students are going to um, get the same scores as all of the other students. Mm -hmm. um, what we want is for them to have as much support as possible. And the support is, it's not just the accommodation during the test. It's the programs and the services we're offering them throughout the year. It's um, a lot of assistive technology and supports that we're giving them again throughout the year and some things that they might use during the, the assessment. Um, as Dave mentioned, this isn't something unique to, to Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Students across the state sure. with all of these supports, we are hoping are going to do the very best that they can. Um, and know. some of the accommodations that are allowed during tr uh, traditional instruction and assessments in the class are not allowed on the state okay. assessment. So mm -hmm. if a student typically has something read to them and it's a reading component of the ELA, it's not allowed to be read to them. Okay. So that uh, makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. The other piece, which um, for especially ELA, if you're thinking a student who's in fifth grade, they are required to take that fifth grade test, so their fifth grade reading level passages are sometimes higher. Those students may be reading at a second grade level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're putting things in front of them that uh, they can't even they can't really decode, right, right. much less be able to read entire passages. Right. And the state has tried for several years and are, I guess are continuing to try to get relief on that from the federal mm -hmm. government so that students could take a more age appropriate assessment, but that has to be approved by the uh, federal government and that has not been permitted to this point. And Sh Charmaine, also just to get a sense for some of our students here at the high school that are gonna take a Regents exam, by the time you put all of the accommodations together, we have students that are spending up to eight hours taking one exam. Um, it takes a significant amount of patience and concentration. I mean, it's, it's really a grueling um, time for some of them. Great, well, thank you. Anyone else, any questions? Just, just a quick one, kind of related to the special ed and also to um, regular students. Um, I think, are they looking at, you know, making the test a little more age appropriate, both for special ed and for regular ed students? I think that'll probably. <laughs> I think that'll probably be done through their review. Pro I would hope it's done through their review process. I mean, they have addressed the length of the assessments, at least trying to reduce it a little bit this year. So hopefully, moving forward, that will be done. Uh, but I still think uh, you know having a student who's let's say a fifth grader who's reading at a much lower level, regardless if they make the test short, they're still going to have a hard time reading that. Just as an example, one of the reading selections on the third grade ELA this year had a sixth to eighth grade Lexile. reading level, mm -hmm. and the questions were so ambiguously phrased that even the author of the selection didn't know what the answer was to a couple mm -hmm. of the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this the last, are they doing local diplomas this year or is that phased out now? For special That's students? still in for special it's ed students. Still in. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Dave. Kathy.